Okay, people, please find a seat so we can get started. Okay, so this evening we're going to uh, start with two reports and then have uh, a few technical topics. The uh, first report will be mine as the uh, IAB chair and then we will hear from the RFC series editor. The first bit of news from the IAB is that the NOMCOM cycle is completed and so um, we have some outgoing folks to thank and some incoming uh, folks to thank, uh, and the continuing uh, folks are going to continue to uh, as well, but what I'd like is the, f the f uh, three outgoing people to come up to the stage, Joel, Elliot, and, and Zing, please. So we have a plaque uh, for each of these uh, for their time on the IAB, and then a couple gifts from the IAB. So Elliot's first. Thank you. Zing. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're the man, you're the man. <laughs> so it doesn't get broken. Thank you. Thanks so much for your years of service. Uh, yesterday, the IAB uh, in their the meeting held elections. Um, our chair position is elected each year, and I'm pleased to announce that Andrew Sullivan was elected the new IAB chair and will be taking that position. Uh, for the open mic this evening. Um, <laughs> Andrew, come on up. Many people don't know because it's rarely used, the IB chair has a gavel. And so at this point, I will be passing the IB chair gavel on to uh, uh, Andrew. Wait a minute. <laughs> Here's your gavel. First, first oh, you, you oh, want the, yeah. all right. Uh, are you going to hit me with it? <laughs> this would be more all appropriate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. That's right. Of course. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, what's going on? <laughs> so uh, many of you uh, may know that, that Russ has a fondness for ice cream. Um, and so I, I thought that this was, this was an opportunity for me to say, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for your, your service. 
uh, as the chair of the IAB. Russ is not going away, by the way. He is, of course, uh, returning to the IAB, and we're very happy about that because I have lots and lots of work for him to do. Um, <laughs> but, 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 before, but before I do that, I want to make sure that he enjoys his ice cream as a token of our thanks. So thank you very much. <laughs> Where do you want me to leave this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, we've had a really busy time since the meeting in, in Honolulu. Um, th this is a, a list of the things that the IB has uh, gotten done. And probably the most uh, exciting one is the top one, where the IB made a statement uh, just at, as the Honolulu meeting was ending that. We believe we should transition so that the internet is encrypted by default. And uh, you can find that statement at the link uh, behind the little here thing. We also made some statements about the Net Mundal initiative. And we published an RFC um, on smart objects uh, in terms of a workshop we held. Um, and we also published an RFC about architectural considerations, and that will be the foundation of the technical uh, topic that's going to be discussed later. Um, we also provided a statement about Unicode 7.0.0. Um, there's some issues that are being discussed this week in the Lucid Boff, and uh, later Andrew will be up to do some technical stuff and talk about how that uh, is challenging some work that needs to be done in the IETF. And the, in the ICANN community, the root, servers, um, op, the root Server System Advisory Committee has gone through a process where they were restructuring themselves. It took them like a year and a half to get that done. Um, and at the end of that, we concluded that we want to continue a liaison relationship with that group. So we uh, made a statement signed both by the RSAC chairs and the uh, IAB that that's the case. Document status, I won't go through each one of these. Um, you, can, you can see them on the slide, but we're continuing to work on these. And one of them, the uh, IANA principles document is in Auth48, so that ought to <laughs> probably pop out sometime this week. Um, and you can see the kinds of topics we're continuing to work on. There were no appeals to the IEB. <laughs> Could hear about that on Wednesday. Um, so we're working on uh, appointment to the Internet Society Board of Trustees. There's information here about the process that's going on. The IEB has asked for input on the candidates that they have. Um, and they want that actually this week. So if you haven't sent it already, uh, please do so. We made two recent appointments, um, Benson to the IOC, and he will take that seat on Wednesday, and Paul to the ICANN Technical Liaison Group. Uh, I want to talk about two workshops, uh, one that we had in January. And there will be uh, a little report out about that as well tonight, and one that's coming up uh, in June. So if you're um, interested in the coordinated attack response uh, workshop, the information is available at the URL on the slide. The IB has uh, it structured its work into programs, and I'm just putting this up to let you know what they are and let you know that we're merging two of them, the ITUT coordination program and the liaison oversight program are being merged. Uh, and so that will take effect this week. And so that's the end of my report. Heather, would you come on up? If I get to give a report, you get to eat ice cream. <laughs> the fairness of life. Um, but my report is now going to be even faster. Okay, um, so I'll keep stuff pretty short and sweet. 
Uh, highlights of what's going on in the RFC editor. This year, the RFC production center contract goes out to bid. That's just how the contract uh, cycle works. Um, I expect the revised statement of work, which in includes an updated service level agreement, to go out for community comment within the next week or two. So keep an eye out for that and offer your input. I would really appreciate feedback. Um, the once we, we've gone through the comment period, I'll accept you know any changes, revise it as needed, send it to the IAOC so that we can actually start the bidding process this summer. Um, the idea is to have actual contracts to be awarded by the September-October timeframe, and then if a transition is necessary, we have a few months to sort that out. Uh, last IATF meeting, we had an experiment run on offering a writing lab. Uh, authors could sign up uh, to work one-on-one -on -one with an editor on particular drafts. This was targeted towards people who found uh, English a rather challenging language to write in, so I thought about signing up myself. Uh, didn't. And <laughs> um, ten, peop ten people uh, did actually sign up, and the feedback was that it was very positive for the participants. They really got a lot out of it. It was also a pretty significant workload on the production center staff because they had usually coming into an IETF meeting, we get a surge of documents for publication and trying to deal with that typical surge of documents as well as at reviewing these, these drafts uh, on top of that and preparing for one-on-one -on -one sessions was, was a lot of work. Um, so we're, we're contemplating how, if and how to support that going forward. Um, so while we're thinking about that and if and how it can fit into the, the general services that the RPC might offer, I'm also considering creating a mailing list um, that, that I would moderate for people who just want to ask language questions about their drafts. Uh, hopefully members of the community would volunteer to help me out with that. If you've got feedback on that, um, drop a note to RFC Interest because I'd like to know if the community thinks that's a good idea. Um, the RPC will continue. They have a, a sort of a tips and tricks document to people often come by the desk and say, well, what's the most common issue that you, you find uh, in drafts? What, what language problems are there uh, to be found? So they've written this up, and we keep it up to date. I believe there's a copy on the Edu team wiki as well as on the RFC editor website. Um, if you want to go straight to it, there's a link at the bottom of the, the slide. How many people have heard that I'm working on the format for RFCs? <laughs> Great. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I just like to check. Um, so most of the drafts uh, involved in setting the requirements for this are now uh, at a point of what I call stable. Stable doesn't mean they're done. Stable means that they're now braced for impact um, when reality hits them and uh, we can adjust them accordingly. So they're not going to be published, but they will form the requirements for the tools and the service going forward. Um, if you want to see the, the list of what the current drafts are, there's an RFC format FAQ off uh, the RFC editor website, and that's out there for anyone to see. Um, we had a comment period for the statements of work. Uh, that will go along with the tools necessary. That common period is closed, but if you've still got things you want to add, you know, feel free, drop a note to either RFC interest or to the uh, tools team. These will go out when, when the last of the drafts have reached stable, so hopefully not too much longer. There are other things underway besides format work. I know some people find that hard to believe at times, given just how big that project is, but there, there are things happening. Um, digital object identifiers. This is of particular interest to many members of the academic community. Um, that's actually now in the programming phase. So we expect to see DOIs assigned to all past and present RFCs as well as all RFCs as they are published going forward by the end of April. Um, the RFC editor website, the really, really old looking website, um, that is also now in programming phase to be uh, brought up to date and actually look like something that was made in this decade. Um, we're working on the scripts behind the scene. That's going to take uh, probably, I think it's supposed to run through September or so um, in getting that cleaned up and, and looking like a modern thing. Google Scholar, um, 
I don't know how many of you knew that we were working with Google to get RFCs properly indexed in Google Scholar. Um, that's, that's a project that's still underway. Uh, we've completed everything on our side in terms of the metadata tags that they wanted and, and other little bits like that. Uh, and now we're just waiting for the actual indexing to happen. They've got a lot of things that they index, so this takes some time. And that's it. If anyone uh, wants to know what's going on, wants to start a question, conversation about RFCs, RFC format, any of the projects, or if you want to um, see what's happening with the RFC Oversight Committee, there are your links. He didn't open the ice cream. And we'll go on to smart objects, I think. Alrighty, so as Russ noted earlier, our technical topic for this evening is smart objects. First, Dave Thaler is going to kind of give an overview and highlight some of the architectural considerations that came out of the IAB work, and then Hannes is going to talk about some of the security and privacy considerations around smart objects. And then we'll open the floor for about 15 minutes of Q&A. Okay, <clears throat> so a few years ago, the IAB observed that there were a number of smart objects being deployed, developed, uh, that did not have IP in them. And so we said, what should we do about this? So we organized this workshop a couple years ago that resulted in the RFC that's on the screen there. Um, that RFC made a couple of recommendations. One of those recommendations was specifically for the IAB. It was that the IAB develop architectural guidelines about how to use existing protocols. Okay? And it also made some recommendations for the IETF to address. Uh, there was also this belief in the industry that IP just was too big to fit on these smart objects. And so that was part of the workshop in the RFC as well. And so we, the IAB, wanted a document that would describe when and why it was appropriate to put uh, IP into smart objects. And so this RFC that just came out this last week is the result of that, a couple years of effort. And thank you to many of you in the IETF that sent us great comments and helped us to improve that because the audience of that document is not you all per se, it's the smart object engineers. Right? This talk is tailored to you and to, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are in the document and kind of what's left for us to think about. So while the IAB was working on, the, on their part of the recommendations from the workshop, Right? The, IE, the IETF and other organizations were also working. There's been, I don't know, at least seven or so different working groups in the IETF that have been chartered, made great progress, and so forth. The IRTF just met uh, as had a proposed research group. Right, That's kind of the IRTF equivalent of a BOF that met this last weekend. The Elwig working group has an RFC that's the one that's on the slide there that has terminology for constrained nodes. And this talks about smart objects that go all the way down to having much less than, say, 10K memory and 100K code. Meanwhile, outside the IETF, various other organizations were busy, right? We had things like the Zigbee Alliance that created the Zigbee IP uh, profile that then adopted IETF technologies. We had the Bluetooth SIG and IETF working closely together on IPv6 over Bluetooth Smart or BTLE. And you had a plethora of IP based alliances that were either formed or expanded, and a bunch of them are listed there in alphabetical order. And meanwhile, the hackers themselves were also working overtime. So we've had all kinds of different um, headlines that you may have seen over the past two years or so. Right? We've had attacks against televisions. We've had hacks against thermostats. We've had hacks against light bulbs. Um, we've had hacks against front door locks and power outlets, even certain toilets. Right? It says, uh, hacking a smart toilet is either a neat trick or a mean prank. That same article then goes on to talk about taking over the hubs that may control all of the home automation. And the hackers did some very creepy things with a toy bunny. <laughs> so what's so special about a smart object anyway? Well, there's at least four different things. There's not one thing that's a smart object. Or when we say Internet of Things, it means many different things. There's at least four different criteria that you might say apply to different types of smart objects. right? Maybe it's very constrained in some way. It doesn't have very much memory or bandwidth or what have you. Maybe it interacts directly with the physical world even when a human isn't present. And so in some sense, it may be more dangerous in that respect. 
It might be physically accessible by untrusted parties and therefore very hard to secure. Or it might be physically inaccessible by trusted parties and be very hard to service. So a particular smart object may have any one of those criteria and maybe more. So when we talk about smart objects, right, there's a big space with lots of different things going on. So when we in the IAB looked at smart object architecture, we looked at sort of three categories of architecture, right? Starting from the bottom, there's decisions that our smart object engineers make around hardware, right? Which type of radio is in there? What's the radio technology? Is it on battery or is it powered? Things like that, right? On top of that, they make decisions based on software stack, right? Is it this software? Which protocols are, are, are in there? Which protocols are implemented and so forth? And on top of that, you have information or data models that say, what's the schemas for these different things? Like, what is a thermostat? What does it expose? That type of thing. Historically, the IATF typically focuses only on the middle layer, okay? Now, of course, in the IAB, we think about things wider than just the IETF. We think about the things that the IETF and its relationship to many other organizations. So that's kind of our job is to look at the big picture, point out gaps, and facilitate relationships between organizations. When the smart objects get connected to the internet, things get a little bit more complex, okay? Which is, you have to deal with the internet protocols. You may have to deal with corresponding attacks against those protocols. And there may be additional privacy issues, for example, multiple jurisdictions, right? If you have a smart object that's not connected to anything else, maybe the only jurisdiction you care about is the one it's physically present in, right? But once that thing is communicating across the internet, the communication itself may span multiple jurisdictions and therefore may have additional legal issues to deal with. So this is kind of the one slide version of, uh, of what the IAB was asked to do in that workshop, which is, you know, to summarize, there's still trade-offs of putting IP in smart objects, right? You see the stack on the left and the stack on the right. If you do put IP into a smart object, you have the left stack, and this means you have to devote, you, the smart object engineer, have to devote some resources to TCP IP, where that same resources, silicon or what have you, could have been devoted to something else that that device might be able to do. And you have to worry about potentially securing IP from outside the local network. If, on the other hand, you don't put IP in there, okay, then you usually need some application layer gateway in order to actually accomplish the rest of your scenario. And that can be a deployment burden. Second example is you might end up reinventing things the IETF already did, congestion control, security, reliability, and so forth. And so you see the app box on the right is a little bit taller than the app box on the left because it includes part of the things that are classically inside TCP IP. And finally, and perhaps uh, often the most important, is you can't leverage the large ecosystem of IP-based knowledge, tools, personnel, training, operational experience, and so forth, the economies of scale that you get from using IP. So this is the inherent trade-off that they have to make, is to say which one of these things is, is more dominant in their case. As we went through this exercise, we identified four common communication patterns, and these are the same communication patterns that show up in some other working groups and things, that we evaluated what's the architectural impact of. So I'll walk through each of these. The first one is the device-to-device -device pattern. Okay? That means you have a smart object that's either talking to another smart object, or talking to another device that's not a smart object, but there's a local network in the middle where that could be IP or it could be non-IP, right? That could be Bluetooth or Zigbee or what have you in the middle. And the trust and security and such things are as deployed today, typically um, based on direct relationships between those two. Sometimes the term pairing is used. Now, if you look at what's actually sold on the market today, most of those things today don't use IP. Okay? They instead they directly, so it's the picture on the right of the previous slide. Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, and so on. Each of those have a, have a forum that takes care of standardizing how to do application or device-specific schemas over that particular layer two protocol. And so as a result, today when we look around at what the current state of affairs is, we have many different organizations that are trying to define data models for different types of smart objects. So how many models of a light bulb or a thermostat are there? There's a bunch of them across the industry right now. That's just the current state of things. There's no common um, information model. So here's an example of a bunch of devices that fit into that category. Okay. Second pattern is the device to cloud pattern, right? So in this case, the smart object connects to the existing network and connects back to a cloud service that's typically run by the same vendor as, as sells the smart object. Okay. The benefit, of course, of this, the reason why they do it, is so that you can access that device or data from anywhere, right? You just talk to the cloud service and you get access to it. 
But the smart object is constrained in this choice of layer two media because it can only depend on what's already ubiquitously deployed in the environments that it's being sold for. So in many cases, such as in the consumer market, this means it's Wi-Fi. Okay? Now, even with Wi-Fi, the question is, how do you get it on the Wi-Fi network to begin with? Right? You've got to get the keys into the thing to get it on the Wi-Fi network. Well, the second problem is there's no ubiquitous standard for configuring the smart objects of those keys. So everybody has their own mechanisms. Um, so often from the same vendor, or sorry, often on a per vendor basis. Um, and so this whole thing together tends to mean that in this picture today, you see lots of silos, right? This vendor's um, red line, a different vendor's red line, and so on. And so what happens here, one of the concerns is that the device object, if that cloud provider ever goes away, goes out of business, or sometimes even changes hosting provider, that smart object can become unusable if it can no longer connect back to the cloud service it's expecting. Okay. And so we point out in the document that's tailored to smart object engineers that you know, there's ways to mitigate that by saying using standard protocols, be IP based, and or using open source. So here's some examples of devices on the market today that fit into this category. And the top left one, little printer, is interesting because this cloud service is actually shutting down this particular month. And so it's an example of that case at the bottom of the last slide. They've chosen to say they're going to outsource, or sorry, to open source their implementation to allow somebody else to do cloud services. So they've already had to go through this. The third pattern is one that kind of takes the other two and puts them together. So the red line there is saying the smart object talks to some application layer gateway. It does this so that that application gate layer gateway can then facilitate communication off to the cloud, such as in the device to cloud model, or to a different local area network, which is the bottom dash line. So this is commonly used whenever there's L2 media that's not ubiquitously deployed, say when the red line is going across 802.15.4 or say in an uh, enterprise environment where you need some custom authentication mechanism that's there, or when you want interoperability with, not, with legacy non-IP devices, right, between two different local networks there at the bottom. Okay, so here, often the smart object and the ALG are from the same vendor. And of course, one of the common models is where the ALG is just an app inside of a smartphone. Now, it's worth pointing out, because we like to look for IPv6 in places, that Having an ALG, actually, you know, there's problems with ALGs, but one of the benefits here is that this does allow IPv6-only devices to access things that aren't IPv6-capable, whether they're non-IP or they're legacy v4-only cloud services or legacy uh, IPv4-only devices. So one of the main points we tried to make in the document was those ALGs, right, we want them to be more generic and not vendor-specific, to work in more classes of devices. Okay. So our point was that it's more cheaper and reliable ones are going to be more likely if the devices use standard protocols that don't require an ALG, okay? Well, that only goes so far because one of the problems that we have today goes back to the choice of data models and schemas, right? Even if the protocols are standard, right, if the schemas aren't the same, you still need an ALG to map the schema, okay? So we can't, in our ITF, at least right now, we can't completely solve the problem, but we can give advice and point out what the gap is and facilitate relationships. So here's an example of some things in the market that are sold as the ALGs in this picture. And here's an example of some things that are sold as smart objects that use an app on a smartphone as the ALG. Okay, so the point is that all of these models are actually widely used in uh, various markets today. And here we pick most of our examples from consumer markets, but the same thing happens in other cases. The fourth model is a little bit different in, in that it goes together with one of the previous ones, typically the cloud to device one. And this is where you have different silos from different vendors but you have scenarios where you need information from different silos together to accomplish some particular task. And so because you have proprietary schemas that go back to there, this is where you have two cloud services that either federate or have APIs between them to, to allow things to work together. So for example, RESTful cloud APIs and so forth. So standard protocols, again, help, but aren't sufficient because you need to have standardized information models, or at least common information models in between two vendors. They're speaking the same schemas, if you will. So here's an example today where you have smart things on the left and you have a drop cam on the right, and you can have a smart things application running on a smartphone that can access the drop cam specifically because the two cloud services provide communication in between each other. So to summarize the observations that we made about the current situation regarding standardization. First issue is that information and data models for various types of smart objects, that there's not a single one that's out there. There's a plethora of them being um, defined right now. 
However, today, this is mostly outside the scope of the IETF. About the only ones the IETF focuses on are data models specifically for connectivity, like what's the model for a router or a switch or a bridge or IP configuration in a device, right? But not for things like thermostats and light bulbs and so forth. There's many other forums in this space uh, with the usual discussions around how you deal with that. Well, that's one of the things we as the IETF uh, look at and point out and facilitate. Second example that I pointed out was how do you get an application onto an L2 network, such as a Wi-Fi network? How do you get a smart object onto that? Well, today, if you look around, there's not a single ubiquitous standard, right? There are some standards, like uh, WPS, for example, that aren't ubiquitously accepted by all types of devices and operating systems and things. So that's about the closest we come to things that are like standards. And so today, you have various proprietary solutions. One common one is just where they put a a web server into the smart object, and so you connect to that thing as an AP, you configure it with a web page, it drops off, it connects to your regular Wi-Fi network. So that doesn't require a standard protocol, it just requires putting a web server into the little smart object, right? And so there's still some desire for having a common mechanism, rather than having every configuration of every device be custom, um, but it's not clear which organization is the best one where it belongs. Is it the Alliance for the L2 technology? Is it the standards product? Standards uh, organization for the L2 technology, does the IETF have a role? Uh, we're not sure exactly, but certainly as, the I, as an IAB looking at the big architecture, it's something that we're looking at. And of course, standardization for most of these, right, it's just seen as being too slow. So even if something does get standards, things are going to be out there in the meantime. So as the IAB, we're often seen as people who look out for the end-to-end -end model. And so what impacts does this have on the end-to-end -end model? Well, there's two IEB RFCs that are worth calling out here. The first one is 1958, which is the architectural or design principles. It says, among other things, the goal is intelligence is end-to-end -end rather than hidden in the network. Okay. But if we go back to the RFC that I quoted from the Elwig Working Group, it talks about that the tiniest of devices don't have enough to actually serve internet connectivity on their own. So they need some gateway type thing. So what does that mean for the end-to-end -end model? Second example. Again, an, IETF, an IAB RFC. All right, 3724 is a statement specifically on end-to-end -end, um, uh, considerations. And it talks about requiring modification of the network is typically more difficult than modifying endnotes. Okay. That statement is no longer necessarily true, right? Well, it can, for example, it can be really expensive, as Hannes will tell us in a second here, to put a secure software update mechanism in a smart object. It might have a very long lifetime. And so as a result, people put modification on the network because they can't change the end devices if they have a long lifespan. So what does this mean for the end-to-end -end model? These are things that are our job to think about. We're thinking about them. Your input is welcome. Uh, the last slide before I hand off to uh, Hannes is that, you know, when we talk about cost, right, often we have to think about the total cost of ownership, which is the sum of at least three things, right, hardware, energy cost, deployment cost, development cost, sorry, and maybe some other things. And this notion of, gosh, it's too expensive to put something in is focusing just on the hardware cost, right? And sometimes people say, or, you know, uh, organizations that do smart objects try to compete on other things, like you buy our object and we will save you money on your power bill, that's smart, manage, smart power management. Or um, uh, the deployability, right? Management stuff may make the total cost of ownership go down because we do a good job of managing in our objects and things. And so this notion of, gosh, it's more expensive to put that into there doesn't have the whole picture in it. Of course, in many enterprises, right, these may, things may come out of different budget lines, and so it can actually be difficult to um, get across this concept of total ownership or at least get the budgeting to work out. Okay? So all of these factors have to be taken into account. And so with this, I'll hand off to Hannes for the security part of the discussion. Thank you, Dave. So there are different methodologies for actually uh, designing a secure IoT system. And I have described four of them here, and we'll go into the details of uh, two of them only. The first one is, is one that you are probably very much familiar with because it's a methodology we, we apply often when writing security consideration sections and apply uh, the work that the IEB has done on RFC 3552, um, for that matter. Um, and the last item, the um, following design patterns, is something that uh, Dave has just talked about, and obviously in taking or learning from those uh, patterns, people also apply the security uh, mechanisms used in those. Um, the IETF, however, has a lot to say also in, in or providing guide, guidance and recommendations in, in the security environment that are also applicable to the IoT context. And uh, 
furthermore, it's very common to actually look at attacks um, to learn from, from mistakes that others did, and I would like to focus on those two. Um, but before I do that, I would like to, um, to highlight that the whole process of developing uh, security solutions is often fairly complicated because there are many different communities involved. And if you look at that picture on the left-hand side, you see the cryptographic community designing principles or primitives like uh, encryption algorithms, hash functions, and so on. Um, standards organization developing protocols and architectures. Uh, implementers actually turning those specification into code. And then finally, the community who does the deployment. And of course, each of those communities have to fight with their own different uh, unique problems. So implementations, as you, as you know, often deal with buffer overflow vulnerabilities, require all sorts of ex extensive testing and so on, secure coding practices, et cetera. So understanding this whole sort of distributed nature of the development process is obviously crucial to uh, deal with some of the security problems on the internet and also in, in the same applies to the IoT context. Um, as said, the IETF has a lot to contribute in that environment, so I picked a couple of those examples which I think are particularly relevant. Um, there's uh, RFC uh, 4107 uh, focuses on key management and it discusses the relationship uh, between manual and automatic key management and by now we, we all know that uh, solutions should focus on, on automatic key management. I will uh, show you on why this is still relevant in, in context of attacks that we see today. Um, a, recently, a recent publication, RFC 7258, um, talks about pervasive monitoring and recommends to use uh, encryption, and, and Russ mentioned the statement uh, early in the, in the plenary. Um, an ongoing effort is, the, uh, is documenting the uh, crypto agility and to allow uh, specifications and, and uh, implementations to actually migrate from one cryptographic algorithm to another one uh, in case there are advances or there are problems with one of those algorithms. And specifically considering the long lifetime of IoT products, we're talking about 10, even sometimes even 20 years, that's obviously an, an aspect to, uh, to think about. Um, there are randomness requirements and key, lan key lens recommendations that I'm going to talk about in, in the next few slides. But uh, it's also worth pointing out that there are two working groups dealing with protocol-specific recommendations that uh, are worthwhile following and looking into, specifically focusing on the use of transport layer security. Um, you, can, you can follow up the links if you don't know the book. Um, so RFC uh, 4086 uh, provides some recommendation requirements and uh, they are very important in, in the context of security protocols because those require randomness in various places, um, such as nonces for key transport, um, for key generation, asymmetric key generation, uh, and also for certain signature schemes. So it's a, uh, a crucial aspect. And in the PC world, um, that's quite easy to, or on server side, it's also very easy to accomplish. Um, or, however, in the embedded space, and an IoT space, that turns out to be complicated because many of the sources of randomness are actually not available. And I'm, I, I list a few examples here. Um, for example, the um, uh, timing, clock timings, the input events um, like mouse movements, keyboard movements, uh, keyboard clicks, uh, disk access timings, IRQ timings, and so on are not available. So what you then find, um, as these two papers, the link papers, uh, indicate that in the wild you actually see many systems basically uh, having no sources of randomness, generating the same keys over and over again, um, which is obviously fatal for security. Key lens recommendation is another important, or the key lens uh, is another important consideration. Uh, as pointed out by Dave, um, in many of the IoT devices have constraints in terms of CPU, so processing speed, uh, memory, and so on. So the temptation is huge to actually uh, reduce the key size to increase performance. But you can, if you go beyond, uh, uh, below a certain threshold, obviously the security is worth nothing anymore. Um, the, the Utah TLS PCP recommends uh, today a one 112-bit symmetric keys to be used as a, as a standard. And if you look at many of the publications and products, you will see that th those do not meet um, those recommended key sizes. There are the publications who recommend slightly lower key sizes depending on, on the usage and the lifetime of the key. Um, 
but it's worthwhile to keep that in mind. Also for the use of asymmetric algorithms, um, in the idea for many of the specifications, uh, the elliptic curve cryptography is recommended because of the um, shorter key size. Um, jumping over to the DAX, I, um, I looked at many different cases and tried to uh, categorize them and to see what the DAX we see today, even though um, some of the deployments are still in a, in a, in a very young and early stage. So I, I have uh, five different categories that I think are worthwhile to highlight and, and there are some lessons to learn from. Um, also, uh, what I like to point out is that there's obviously um, with some of the um, patterns, communication patterns, you have to consider the server side as well, the server side infrastructure. If, if you don't secure the server side, obviously it makes no sense to um, just secure the client side where the, when the IoT devices upload everything to the cloud. Uh, and that's also what uh, the OBUS sec uh, security project recommends in their um, IoT guidelines. Um, so start with the first one. Uh, beginning of last year, Bruce Schneier had an interesting article where he points out that many of the IoT devices have no or no convenient software update mechanism. And that's indeed true. Um, so in, in this specific case, um, um, a case from the KUS Communication Congress uh, published last year, end of last year, it was pointed out that uh, a software update mechanism uh, using TR69, an implementation found in many routers, but also uh, in, in home routers, but also in, in many Internet of Things appliances who use the same mechanism, um, had a bug. Uh, and that's obviously not uncommon, so it's good to have the, the software update mechanism, but uh, that specific one had a bug, uh, buff a buffer overflow. And that bug was, the software was shipped in 2002, the bug was um, fixed, or uh, was fixed in 2005. But unfortunately, to the long value chain between sort of the company uh, producing that server and, and um, silicon vendors and, and uh, ISPs and et cetera, these boxes are still vulnerable today. Um, so it's not only uh, important to provide the software update mechanism, but also then to find out on how to distribute the software updates itself. So, and that raised the discussion on whether some of these IoT devices should actually have a sort of a time to live, uh, referring back to uh, the little printer that Dave mentioned uh, earlier. So should these uh, devices die after a certain uh, time or when the vendor uh, decides that it doesn't support it anymore? A f also a fairly common is a missing uh, key management. And here's an example from a, uh, a light bulb again um, in this case, in, in many of those um, lighting scenarios, you have um, smartphone connecting to it being used to control uh, these lights, and they connect to those using wireless LAN, but then the lights themselves um, use IEEE 802.15.4, uh, a low bar radio technology uh, in a mesh multi-hop network. And, and of course, you need a key management solution uh, there to secure the messages, and some of the vendors take shortcuts. Um, and in this specific case, the shortcut was to use the same AES key in all of those products, um, which of course simplifies the key management tremendously. Um, <laughs> um, up to the point when some researchers came along, extracted the firmware image and used IDA Pro to uh, disassemble the code and found the, uh, the key. And then obviously that, um, lacking a firmware update mechanism obviously didn't help either. Um, you, you may think that these are mistakes uh, only made by small startups who don't have the resources. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, as the example, a recent example from BMW with their connected drive shows because they had the same problem among other problems. Um, uh, another LED uh, light bulb example uh, is this one where that illustrates a missing access control. So in this, in this case, uh, it was reported that uh, hackers had used light bulbs and the um, missing configuration setting there to turn on and off the lights, uh, which is pretty annoying. Um, <laughs> but, and they used, um, they used a nice program called ZMAP to scan the whole internet to actually find them first, um, which is a very efficient version of NMAP. Uh, doesn't even require an hour to search the whole internet, IPv4 internet. And so you would want to like, who would care about light bulbs? Who would want to switch on and off my light bulbs in my, my house? Um, and that's a fair question. Um, however, it turns out that uh, products, other products have the very same vulnerabilities 
like cameras, surveillance cameras, baby cameras, uh, gas stations, um, very much the same, uh, the same pattern. And there you can very easily see uh, the problems. And there are even websites that actually list you that you can conveniently browse through um, surveillance cameras and, and other cameras found on the internet um, to see what people are doing. Um, and if you switch to, uh, to industrial control systems, you very quickly see the potential of um, harm that can be done. And, and I've included a, uh, an example on where exactly the same problem happened. In, in a publication called Green Lights Forever, some researchers looked at traffic control systems and you see an architecture picture on the right. It illustrates on how these, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the roads, how these systems are interconnected wirelessly in, in the different components. And it turns out even also for these uh, systems that the wireless communication is not secured using encryption. The, um, there are default passwords used. Some of them are even hardwired, so you can't even change the default passwords. Um, and what I like most with this one, in another uh, publication, uh, researchers extended, expanded that attack and used drones. So they wrote uh, in that paper, even tested the attack launched from a drone flying at over 650 feet, and it worked. Um, and that uh, may give you some, some nice advantages as you, as you go through the city. Um, an attack, uh, some of the attacks, well, IoT devices enable another class of attacks, which I have previously not been exposed to um, too much before I started working at ARM. And those are physical attacks. And um, for those, you often need um, some special hardware, which I show on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And you can do power analysis, um, glitching attacks, um, used to either bypass access control or extract uh, keys in a, in a fairly convenient way, even though the um, crypto techniques are perfectly, uh, perfectly secure by itself. It's the implementation that uh, leads, uh, leaks some, some information. And what is interesting in this environment is that the tools get cheaper and cheaper, and there are lots of tutorials on how to use them, so it's uh, more accessible to a broader audience. And I believe we, see, we will see more and more of those uh, in the future. So the, the, um, the upper one called JTAGulator is a tool to connect to different pins on, your, on, on a printed circuit board. And you, the, the, the platform then uh, searches on and finds out what communication protocol is used uh, and potentially then uh, you can connect to those different um, components to different uh, modules on that board. Very nice uh, tool. The, the lower one is uh, called Chip Whisperer. It's a, it's a platform for doing um, side channel analysis and side channel attacks and glitching attacks, also available for uh, a very good price. Uh, we're talking about $500 here. Um, as, as a remark from, the, from those attacks, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, many of the Internet of Things security we see today is very much like uh, the, I, uh, the PC security 20 years ago. Even though many of the attacks today look more like um, the attacks of script, script kiddies, but if you look outside the consumer space into the industrial environment, you, you already see the, the potential or the direction where this is heading. Um, and one example here was an attack last year at a German steel factory where the attackers managed to um, change the, the, the process and um, damage the steel factory. And in another attack in, um, in Poland, a pipeline was uh, blown up and it was done in such a way that the administrators of that system who continuously monitor it uh, only learned about the attack 40 minutes after the attack has actually happened, that the, the pi after the pipeline blew up. So it's, um, those are more sophisticated and you obviously need to understand the, the processes of the factory, so different incentives here. The risk analysis for many of those IoT devices are, is also more complicated because they are not only the direct risks uh, that are probably that come to mind to, to most people, but they're also indirect ones, um, like we have seen with uh, DDoS attacks uh, years ago um, against Comcast or uh, using printers where reflection attacks were used uh, in, a, in a massive DDoS attack. Um, moving away from, privacy, uh, from security, I would like to also touch briefly on privacy since we got a lot of comments on, on the privacy side. Um, the IEB publication, RFC 6973, provides good generic guidance, and most, many of it is also applicable to engineering efforts in the IDF for these type of protocols. So it's definitely worthwhile to look at those. But IoT uh, poses a couple of other additional challenges um, 
and I list two, um, two of them here, like the quality of consent. Many of the devices don't have a user interface, so it's very difficult to um, ask user for consent in a, in a real-time fashion or in a meaningful fashion. Um, there's also the desire of companies to use big data analysis and to collect uh, lots of data from different devices and then correlate those to find new insi uh, interesting insight. And um, doing that uh, obviously raises privacy, privacy concerns for the end users. And there's a, uh, a publication that we reference um, that was timely in, the, in that sense uh, from one of the European institutions uh, that specifically focuses on, on those aspects, uh, deployment-related aspects. Um, to summarize, so one of the observations that, that we made from the workshops uh, and also from writing the report that we believe that using I IETF and, and Internet protocols is, uh, uh, for Internet of Things is, is definitely uh, doable and, and is important and saves a lot of uh, problems. The recommendations that we provide are uh, uh, solid and can be, can be used. So those include um, using state-of-the-art key lens, um, using well-analyzed security protocol, use uh, encryption to deal with pervasive monitoring, and also to support automatic key management with all the considerations that go along with it. Um, however, there are some IoT-specific recommendations that I would like to point out that uh, crypto agility is something that's a hard decision uh, and for, for designers, and uh, they have to deeply think about it, specifically since many of the algorithms in IoT devices for performance reasons are actually in hardware. So switching from one algorithm to another one is actually not that easy. Um, to also integrate a software update mechanism and leave enough headroom for for these updates. Um, include a random number, hardware-based random number generator in, in the devices. And many of the, the chips that you find out today actually don't have such a uh, random number generator. Uh, when you do the threat analysis, uh, also think about physical attacks, because as I said, uh, they would be more common. And also um, use modern operating system techniques on those devices, since many of them Many of these embedded systems have a very simplistic uh, concept where a single bug in the whole um, software can ruin the entire security. There's no separation of uh, processes and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes and Dave. Um, so now it's time for questions and answers. Um, just to let people know, we are actually using some smart objects for queue management, and we're using light bulbs, of course. They will start out green when you first start asking your question. They will fade to yellow as your time is running out, and then you will get a flash of red, which means it's time to stop talking, okay? So people can be concise, and then let everybody have an opportunity to ask their questions. Is, is that enforced with some kind of laser gun? Or? I can't, you're, you're, we're not hearing you in the microphone, <laughs> Christian. Pardon me? Oh, this one doesn't work? I, yeah, I don't think that it's on. It's been hacked. It's already been hacked. Um, let's go ahead and start over here while you're, yeah. Thank you, Mike Jones, Microsoft. Um, I'm curious, Honest, Dave, others, where are the ITF's points of leverage in this conversation? I mean, commercial realities is that people will get things in the marketplace and sell them if they appear to work, if they are commercially viable at the moment, and asking people to do things like put an expiration date on your product is just probably not commercially viable. That being said, we have a lot of experience. What conversations are we and should we be having? This, okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a uh, very good question, Mike. Um, so you, you see different uh, folks in the community who work in that space providing not only sort of their time to develop specifications, but also writing code, uh, providing open source software. So I hope um, that and there are all sorts of uh, publications that say we, we will have uh, 50 billion of those devices or even more in a, in a couple of years, that uh, the companies who um, most likely also s many small companies who would then focus their efforts on, on providing some uh, competitive technology rather than spending all their time designing new security mechanisms and internet protocols. So they would just reuse the existing stuff uh, 
not only specifications, but also the code that they have. And so hopefully by doing that, they will avoid many of the pitfalls. And so they actually spend their time on, on the things they are good at. Yeah, okay. I'll just add that the leverage is that, um, that they make decisions based on what's cheapest and most financially profitable for them. So to the extent that we can do the design work for them so they don't have to repeat that, and the fact that we can have a large ecosystem of compatible um, personnel experience tools and so on, then that becomes economically uh, better for them. And so I think that's the indirect tool that we have is rough consensus and running code. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the back right microphone since Christian was up here at the dud one. Yeah. That one's not working either? Holy moly, that one wasn't working either. I don't think that one's working either. Do we want to grab one? <coughs> Make sure it's on. No. <laughs> oh, there we go. This one or snap? Um, Hannes, at some point you said in your uh, presentation, you talked about like maybe introducing some kind of, uh, uh, you know, lifetime for devices and, and shelf life. Um, <clears throat> so I understand like where, where, where this idea would come from, but we, you know, we have other kind of responsibilities too. I mean, we're talking about billions of devices and if there's some kind of like uh, uh, program obsolescence for these things, I mean, What's, what's the impact on sustainability uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so not just the, the code, uh, but actually the, the, the resources that, um, uh, you know, if, if we design a world where um, we're gonna have even more waste, I mean, I think uh, we're going in the wrong direction. So I think there's a balance to strike here. And um, yeah, I would, I would hate to work for a, for an organization, organization that is going to produce more waste, basically. So uh, I think it's a very important thing that you know we need to take into account. And uh, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So so I didn't come up with the idea to give uh, IoT products a um, sort of time to to live. Um, but uh, those are some of the discussions that you see, for example, in a in a recently published uh, FTC report on Internet of Things, uh, and it's it's obviously something inspired by. Uh, uh, Microsoft discontinuing Windows XP, and that has also raised questions because you find us on uh, um, point of sales terminals and, and so on. So um, it's an interesting thing, an interesting question to think about, and and also the approach that this um, company with the little printer did on, on open sourcing their their software, which of course may not be a solution for everyone, but it's it's probably hard to make recommendations to companies uh, already up front to tell them, think about what happened if your company went, goes bankrupt. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky problem. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Okay, okay and we're also gonna have to freeze the microphone cues right now. So whoever's the last now, that's it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, right, Christian, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. I'm Christian Wittema from Microsoft. Uh, I have a question for, for Hannes. I mean, uh, I appreciate that you have a privacy slide in your presentation, but I found it a tiny bit sketchy. <laughs> and and when, when I see that, yes, you point a real question, which is if we collect all that data, that data ends up in databases that can be used for good and evil, and we have to control that, that's sure. But think of me walking around with my smartwatch and uh, my smart shoes and my smart uh, belt, uh, taking all kinds of measurements <laughs> and sending all kinds of radio message. I look uh, like a, a green beacon that's gonna turn yellow and red <laughs> and people can track me. That, that's a real problem. If we, don't, if we don't find these kind of issues of, can you be tracked with those devices when they are moving? Uh, can, they, can they listen to the traffic of those devices and deduce who's there? I mean, there are all kinds of issues there that. We are just backfitting into the current TCP IP architecture, and we should think of that from the start with the smart objects. Uh, uh, definitely, and I, I wish I had more time to expand uh, the privacy discussion. Um, as, as you know, it's a very complicated top topic with many facets, uh, and it's, it, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is part of, yes. yeah. So, so, um, so I, d I don't know how to satisfactorily answer your question. Uh, other than it's, uh, telling you that you are right, uh, there's, there are complicated questions. <laughs> okay. 
the job of the CRIPSEC uh, yeah, program that we had that yeah. Christian is a member of, and we look forward to his contributions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, but there are, um, obviously, the IDF can't make uh, deployment decisions. So, for example, if, uh, in terms of if you think about uh, uh, one of the models that uh, Dave described where devices talk to the cloud, they're obviously uh, more privacy invasive than, than some others uh, who are very local, uh, but they also provide different features. So um, it will, will be difficult to, uh, to help there. What the IDF could, however, do is to develop uh, technologies that companies could use to enhance the privacy, the privacy of the end users, of the customers, if they wish to do so. Okay, so we're going to move over to the left-hand queue here. Yes. Uh, Renee Stark. Um, I just had a few things that came up uh, on mostly security issues. So I think one of the uh, main impacts is really on the life cycle. I think if you, if you look at the development of these, these devices, you will have uh, lots of uh, different elements in the chain. And it may be that components change from one manufacturer to the next. They may not trust each other. At some moment, uh, questions come up is uh, uh, how, when, and where are you doing initial keying? Um, uh, when, where, and also uh, are you going to uh, put an identifier on the device? And then are you going to do binding? I think some of these issues are, are not traditionally well addressed in IDF, so I think that that's, would be a good one. Um, I also, I was happy to see the cost of ownership slide, um, but I also do know that uh, lots, of cost, lots, of, lots of cost issues come up in uh, technical discussions where uh, sometimes the tendency is to, to water down the required functionality to meet uh, a cost figure. And uh, just as context, if you deploy uh, an Internet of Things device, and as soon as you have to have a human in the loop, you've already spent more than the cost of the device itself. So I, th I think some of these considerations should really also be uh, tackled more by ITF itself. I still have a little bit of light. Um, the other one is I really like your slide about uh, no trusted platform and physical attacks and so on. I think uh, it's underappreciated that lots of these devices will be out in the open on a garage door accessible to everybody. So physical attacks, implementation attacks, maybe we can replace some of the trusted platform by um, the network providing that as an alternative. So I think that would be a nice research topic to basically move functionality towards that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bernard Boba, Microsoft. So uh, thank you for putting together a presentation with a truly terrifying series of attacks. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why things improve is Moore's law may allow you to do more more of the things that you would do, like in a in a PC or a large environment. Can you comment on how much you think Moore's law will be a benefit here, or how much it can be exploited? Because I know there are very severe energy constraints. Do you think that, say, ten years from now, most of the things on your slides will be be fixed? Um, so if I if I find Carsten, he would probably say. Uh, Moore's, the benefit of Moore's law will be eaten up by uh, by other aspects like uh, energy, energy efficiency and so on. But of course we see um, sort of interesting uh, economics at play here because um, simply large volumes of devices uh, create new possibilities. Uh, and large volumes in sectors that actually have nothing to do with another sector actually may spill over. And so we see a lot of um, uh, companies providing um, chips that they take from mobile phones where the volumes are massive and then apply them to completely different sectors and you suddenly get um, devices at a, at a ridiculously cheap price uh, and that enables new possibilities. So, so we I'll just add that Moore's Law helps attackers too. So a number of the attacks will still be there. Yep. Hi, Phil Hunt, Baker. So this morning at about 10 o'clock, uh, my iPhone went off telling me that uh, the smoke detector in my home had, one of them had failed. Uh, a couple of hours ago, I got a phone call uh, from my, the folk back there uh, talking about the interactions with the fire department because apparently the device detected that its uh, sensor had failed and then proceeded to sound the alarm. And, the, and of course, even though, you know, this is a one-directional thing. 
Uh, it'll tell me that the alarm is off, but it won't allow me to turn it off because, you know, mm -hmm. users are stupid. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I really came up for, which is... Um, my problem is the openness and the stupidity of the business model. In the, I've got about 20 light switches that are internet connected. And they, and they come from different vendors because you can't get one that meets all of the needs I have. And the thing is that every one of those vendors has the model of the customer's going to come to us, buy a box from us, and then rent the service back from us. It's kind of like capital cost and razor and blades. And it's kind of like, so I bought this Revolve Hub. Okay, so, uh, which was said that I could connect up to all of them and then control them from one platform, which was fine. Only I could only connect, control it from the iPhone. But, and then that was bought out by a company that bought them out and then shut them down the next day. <laughs> so what this is coming to, I really need some way of knowing if a device is going to be open or treacherous. I would really like to have one ITF protocol that I could look for on the box and see if it supports that protocol, I know that it's something that I'm going to be able to control and put under my system's control rather than being hijacked by a, uh, you know, a razor and blades model and whatever. I'd really like to see that. So that's a good point, yes. Um, one of the points that I made is yes, but that's not sufficient, meaning that's necessary but not sufficient because the schema issues are still there lurking. And even if you solve the common protocol thing on the box, it doesn't mean that you don't have a proprietary schema that's in there that you can actually use. So everything that you said, and the problem is even worse. Carrie Lynn Verizon. Uh, so a couple comments on us. Uh, first, it might be good to socialize in, in a talk like this, uh, the vernacular uh, in 7228 so that people know, have a common understanding of what we mean by constrained devices or the classes of those. Um, uh, second, I absolutely uh, agree with your comment that we need to do a secure update because if we get that wrong, everything else is hosed. Um, I like the fact that you called out, for example, that uh, randomness, a good source of, uh, of randomness is something that needs to be built into the hardware. And I would sort of encourage you and others to work on uh, extending that into a min cover set of, you know, what potentially needs to go into IoT devices. And I, I imagine that's going to be a moving target, but, um, and finally, I rage against the dying of the light. <laughs> Michael. Uh, oh, Michael Richardson. No, okay. okay. Hi, Michael Richardson. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of things. Thanks for a great, great uh, tech plenary. Um, so the bunch of things I wanted to comment. I was aghast when I think it was actually Dan Greer that said about the stuff that you, you know IoT devices need to be ha be upgradable or have a, a end of life on them. Mm -hmm. And um, and as Carrie just said, and I was going to say, one of the things we could do and we need to do is we actually need a common secure update protocol. And you know, I don't know. It might be TFTP over DTLS. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But, but the point is it has to be absolutely so stupid and small that devices can run it even though they don't have the ROM to double buffer, okay? And, and I think that's a major contribution that we could do. The other thing that I finally took home from Dan Greer's talk and other people saying this is that it's the software that has to have an end of life, okay? The device doesn't have to go to a landfill at that point. If it's not field upgradable, it might be store upgradable. You pointed to all the JTAG programmers. So maybe some of the devices, you know, after five years, they stop working or they say they're going to stop working, like my um, uh, smoke detectors. I'm supposed to change the batteries twice a year, right? Or they complain to me. Um, so maybe that's what they're going to do. They're going to say, please change me now, please change me now. I'm going to stop in six months. I'm going to talk to you or whatever. And uh, you bring them in and that's what they do. And that's how we can avoid the terrible, I think, e-waste story of that. Um, and so again, secure update. I think we got to do it. Yep. Thank you. I've, a number of people have said that this week, including at the proposed research group that happened this last weekend. So yep. Second. Elliot. Elliot Lear. Uh, to Michael Richardson's point about uh, stupid small update protocols, I'm very confident we can get at least half that done. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I was going to say that uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, Hannes and Dave for, for this presentation. Uh, there are a couple of things that I think are worthy of highlight from uh, the combination of the two presentations. Uh, the first is uh, that Hannes put up this requirement, and we've heard a couple of people like Perry and others uh, talk about uh, the need for uh, random numbers, uh, uh, good random number generators. But the fact is that economics works against that in terms of cost of goods and services. Now, if we couple that with the point that Dave made earlier in his presentation, about RFC uh, 1958, I think it is, uh, that talks about uh, the end-to-end -end model. Uh, what, we what, what that brings us to is that, in fact, we have a very big challenge in this organization in terms of our own operating assumptions that we need to re consider and decide whether we re revisit the assumptions or if we double down in terms of saying, no, really, smart devices need to have these things. And if so, how are they going to get them in an economically sensible way? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Elliot. Matt Mathis, um, there's also a mechanism to um, force retirement. Um, and I'm going to start out by pointing out that um, there's been some recent stories of attacks delivered from home routers and no way to remove these, these devices from the market, no, no way to remove them from the, from the field. And it coming up in a security conference that's in fact illegal to scan even to fingerprint devices to discover that, they're, that they've been owned. Um, but in fact, these devices are remotely brickable. And once something reached a threshold of egregious bug, they should just be bricked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it should be obligatory for the research community to brick them. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for your attention and your questions and comments. So I'd like uh, Brian and um, Andrew to come on up. So what we're going to have is a very brief workshop report followed by a uh, discussion of the internationalization statement that the IAB made and then we'll have open mic. So Questions, if you have about either of these two presentations, will be taken during the open mic. Hi, so I'm uh, Brian Trammell. This is actually the first time I've ever stood up here and said anything other than Brian Trammell, IAB. So, Brian Trammell, IAB. Um, also, uh, co chair of the uh, semi workshop, um, which I'll talk about briefly, very briefly. Um, so uh, this was uh, put together by the IAB Stack Evolution Program, which is currently focusing on two broad areas. Um, the evolution of interfaces to transport network layer services beyond just sort of SOC stream and SOC DGRAM, uh, trying to support you know, the new applications uh, that uh, are coming out of the, um, well, the entire community, as well as improving tra path transparency in the presence of firewalls and middle boxes. By path transparency, we mean you know, if we put a packet on the wire, how mangled is it going to come out the other side? Um, so this is uh, sort of following a longer interest the IEB has in general issues of protocol evolution. So I'd point everybody to RFC 5218, what makes a successful protocol. If you haven't already read it, um, uh, go through it instead of the rest of this talk. It's more interesting. Um, and the uh, ITAT, the um, Internet Technology, um, I forget the last two words, Elliot, Adoption, screen. Adoption and Transition Workshop. Um, so within the program, we also said, well, ITAT was actually, um, ITAT was uh, very good in sort of framing that discussion. Uh, let's convene another workshop in January to discuss ossification specifically at the transport layer and how we can fix it for emerging applications. So why now? Um, this sort of ossification has been going on for um, at least as long as I've been using the internet. Um, what makes us think that there's um, uh, something that we can do at this point in time. Well, there's a lot of new energy in the IETF, so there's work that requires flexibility that we don't appear to have. Um, so RTC Web and TCP Inc. Uh, are uh, looking at using the transport stack in ways so that the RTC Web data channel, um, which is um, SCTP over DTLS over UDP, um, we're stacking things on top of that 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 looks like, ooh, okay, well maybe we need to think about the architecture of what's going on here. Um, there's also work to provide that flexibility at the interface, um, such as in the TAPS uh, working group. And I'm not going to say the word that we said a lot the last time, um, but there's a lot of them. 
Um, there's also pressure created by the increasing deployment of encryption. Um, if we do everything over TLS, which is the easiest way to do it, then we're gonna brick a lot of deployed middle boxes. Um, okay, and we can go home now, that's not a problem. Um, <laughs> but there is an opportunity to strike a balance between breaking everything and having no privacy, and we wanted to look at how we can, we can sort of do this, um, how we can get the look off of Woody the operator's face and maybe make this a little bit less painful transition. So, um, quick summary of uh, the workshop. We had 20 position papers accepted. We sent 38 invitations. Uh, the stated goals of the participants at the beginning of the workshop were we wanted to get a deeper understanding of the architecture and the incentives to deploy uh, changes to the transport stack. We want to look at uh, what we can do to broaden these interfaces beyond um, BSD sockets. Um, we want to look at the state of further research and community education, but a lot of people, above all, um, there was a lot of interest in definition of uh, these cooperation approaches for middle boxes. There were kind of two camps on um, transport evolution, uh, and I know at least one of you is gonna get up the mic and correct me about this, but um, it's a pretty good joke. There was the um, People's Front of UDP and the TCP Liberation Front. <laughs> More seriously, there is a, there is a, a balance between how much energy do we want to put into um, fixing the fact that there's a lot of middle boxes out there, oh crap, I said it, a lot of devices on path um, <laughs> which believe that they're helping by mucking about in TCP packets and how much do we wanna say, let's put a new header on it so that you don't know what's going on. So the identified goals of the workshop uh, were some future work. Uh, we didn't know whether it's a working group, a research group, a mailing list, a barb off, a bunch of people in a bar. Um, talking about mechanisms for detection of these things on the path and uh, for impairment detection, troubleshooting, and looking at the characteristics. Uh, better understanding of, so architecturally, of how transport should and must evolve, including applicability to, of specific transports to specific use cases. Um, exposing more information to the application about transport in the right way so that it's actually useful, um, not just giving more knobs that aren't never, are never going to be used and then identifying the trust issues and employment incentives and cooperation evolution approaches. So it turns out that if you're actually trying, letting devices on the path do things to your packets, um, this works really, really well if you've solved the trust and key distribution problem, um, but otherwise it's hard. Uh, one of the easiest outcomes to come to was the outcome on measurement. We didn't talk about this very much because we went around the room once and said, ah, yeah, this is, we know what to do, let's actually do it. The result was the uh, hops barb off uh, at uh, 9.30 Sunday night last night. I gotta say the hotel was very nice in letting us take beer in mass from uh, the bar to one of the meeting rooms. It was an actual barb off in a hotel. That was, I was impressed by that. Um, the idea here is that basically we're making decisions about how we're going to move forward and we need data to do it and we need to get the people who have the data together with the people who have the questions that they wanna ask of that data. Um, on cooperation, uh, this is a slightly uh, revised version of the slide that I didn't get to present uh, last time in Honolulu. Thank you, Dave. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the idea here is that you uh, have an architecture for exposing what you must to the path you, everything else is end to end up in these, this uh, green box um, and crypto keeps everybody honest. So we're gonna be talking about that at the Spud Boff uh, 9 a.m. Wednesday in this room actually it turns out so we do have enough space apparently. So once you have this mechanism, okay, here's the thank you Dave. Um, once you have this mechanism, uh, what do you say with it? Um, the, the things that came out of this discussion is that there needs to be an incentive to expose information both for the applications, the endpoints, and the path, and there need to be incentives not to lie. So we've done a lot of, of approaches at path signaling before, and if there isn't, if you get something by lying, then you're going to do it. So you need to describe or define the vocabulary in such a way that you don't get anything for lying, or at least you don't get anything predictable for lying. This is easy to look at in the app to path situation. Um, there is probably a minimal set of useful information which you can expose, which is useful to the far endpoint, which can be verified. So for example, things like um, session lifetime. I mean, you get this right now, middle boxes look at the TCP flags and say, okay, well, here's the SIN, here's the SIN, and here's the FIN. If you've encrypted the TCP header, you need some way to expose, okay, this is the first packet, this is the last packet. The way forward is less clear when we're looking at the, um, uh, uh, signaling in the other direction from devices on path back to the applications. 
this might be a tractable problem. It basically looks a lot like ICMP, but in band and bound to a socket so that it's easier for the kernel to figure out where to take that ICMP message and, and hand it off to the application. So if it's treated in that way, then it, it might be a tractable problem. But if the path is saying, um, here is something, you must do it, um, this goes into the um, trust issues and this is previously unsolved and very hard. So things to do, um, I really hope to be able to point you at a initial uh, workshop report uh, here, um, but uh, I will point you at the webpage, uh, IAB Org Activities Workshop Semi, uh, where we have the transcriptions, uh, the transcripts, the slides, and the position papers up. Um, the initial workshop report is real soon now, and I'm going to say mid-April in order to force myself to get it done. Um, there's been some cooperation with the Etsy NFV forum on middle box issues, especially with respect to encryption. Um, there have been, uh, we'll uh, have discussions on transport extensibility and area meetings uh, in the prog time frame. Uh, there's some work on encapsulation guidelines for UDP and expect at some point a statement coming out of the uh, program in the IAB on architectural assumptions and transport evolution. So if you'd like to learn more um, on the, um, on the uh, SPUD thing, on the cooperation protocol, uh, come to the BOF again Wednesday morning here in this room. Uh, hops has already happened, uh, but you can join the mailing list. That's hops.itf.org. Um, the transport services working group is working a little bit on the interfaces and sort of the, the uh, um, uh, services that are, well, transport services working on services provided to transport, by transports, like looking at how you can decompose um, transport protocols in, such, in ways that you could build interfaces on top of this that would be more adaptive. And then other future work uh, can be referred to the Stack Evolution Program. Thank you very much. already do. I don't know what's up there. I don't know what to do, Cindy. <laughs> exactly. How's that? Oh, there we go. All right. So while we fool with uh, with the display issue, because this is this is sort of um, ironic, right? Uh, we had. Uh, um, you may be aware that there are people in the world who do not write in ASCII characters, and um, uh, they sometimes like to have identifiers that are useful to them in things that they write in, because that way they can remember them, because they can't remember things in ASCII characters because they don't use them. So. The idea was that we were going to internationalize identifiers, and so what we did is we picked um, Unicode, and you may all remember that there have been a number of plenary um, topics about this and all the rest of it. Right. So we, we had uh, a, a mechanism for this called IDNA 2003 for the DNS, and we didn't like that, so then we came up with IDNA 2008, um, and that seemed to be working fine, and so then we generalized that entire approach using uh, a thing called PreC, and that working group is, is in the final um, stages of, what it's, um, uh, of its work. And this all depends on a thing called Unicode, which is a, a way of having a universal character set, right? So there's the background. Now, Unicode has versions, 
And each version of Unicode adds some characters, adds some code points, because code points are what make, uh, makes up Unicode. And in the uh, version 7, uh, there were some characters that were added, some code points, and um, uh, this gets added to the IDNA 2008 uh, stuff, look at that, um, using, um, uh, using expert review. So we had an expert review, and the expert review noticed a thing. And the thing that it noticed is that there, there is this, this um, history. Is that not working for you? <laughs> it's not putting what I want up there. How about if you gather the windows? I don't know. That's my next try. Um, uh, I am. I, I'm apparently not in IT anymore. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, so the idea was that we we would look through this. So, so Unicode Seven added a a, a, a code point called Be with Hamza above, which is an Arabic code point. Now, it, it turned out that we always had this ability to write the character Be, the the Arabic character Be, and and to put a mark called Hamza above on it. And it produced a thing that looked a certain way on the screen, which in the event we ever got uh, um, this working, you would be able to see. Um, and, and, and the new, th this is the answer. We just call the manufacturer. <laughs> I think this is, this is what we need. This is what makes the ITF great. Uh, <clears throat> look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here, I'll give you that back. So thank you very much to Stuart. Um, so what, what happened is we've got, we've got this uh, Bay with Hamza above character, and we had the previous arrangement, which was the Bay with the Hamza above. So this is how we realized it. And the IAB put out a statement um, because we were worried um, uh, identifiers are used by humans, um, and these were in the single script, and we had a, a bunch of meta rules for how you would do the, uh, these kinds of things. And, and the thing is, it didn't seem to us that humans could tell these apart, but of course, they're different code points, and so machines are going to think they're different. Humans don't um, tell them apart. That seems like a problem for identifiers, right? Because if you have two things that you think are the same, but the machine thinks are different, not a good identifier. It turns out this is not abnormal. This, this case that we discovered, or we, we stumbled upon for the first time. There were some other cases in, in Arabic script that we noticed, and th those were originally included in the IAB statement. That was unfortunate, and we updated it, because in fact, this is not related to Arabic at all. Um, and it turns out there's a whole bunch of cases like this, and it's not even clear that they all work the same way. So the IAB called for some work. We said, would you please like, have another look at this, because uh, identifiers are sort of an important thing, because you, know, you want to identify things, because that's what you wanted to do in the first place. So um, uh, we said, well, we, you know, would, would people please do some work? And fortunately for us, um, uh, some people got together and decided, well, yeah, we ought to do that. And so we've got this lucid boff on, uh, on Wednesday. It's in the Parisian room, which is uh, itself kind of ironic because it's misspelled, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, but it's in the Parisian room um, uh, on Wednesday afternoon after the lunchtime session. Uh, there uh, also is a talk to uh, working group chairs on Wednesday. Uh, uh, about uh, Precy and how that might affect your um, uh, how that might affect your working group. So we're hoping that um, that this is going to work, and that this time for sure we're going to get it right. <laughs> uh, that's all I have to say about this topic. And with that, I'm going to call the IAB um, outgoing and incoming up here. And apparently, I get to stand up and be the main tomato <laughs> target. Um, and I, I guess I can probably turn this off um, because because having an IAB thing with turns out it's not abnormal at the top. <laughs> and and we are going to open the mics now. So if you you know if you've been holding up um, your your remarks, now is your chance. Is there a way, in fact, to just? <laughs> Very nice. Um, this is a mallet, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you don't have the reach. It's 
good. Uh, all right, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start all the way over there because you haven't sat down yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Drums, incoming. Mark Lasher, IAB. Ted Hardy, IAB. Suzanne Wolf, incoming IAB. Elliot Lear, outgoing IAB. Joel Halpern, outgoing IAB. Eric Nordmark, IAB. Brian Trammell, IAB. Andrew Sullivan, IAB. I guess I'm the chair now. Russ Housley, outgoing IAB chair. Mary Barnes, IAB. Robert Sparks, incoming IAB. Dave Beaver, continuing. Sim Lee, outgoing IAB. Yariak, IAB chair. Joe Hildebrand, continuing. Heather Flanagan, RFC editor, not actually IAB. All right, we'll start here. David Black, Andrew, following up on uh, the presentation you just gave, I uh, wanted to ask, did you want to say anything about Unicode normalization forms and how they've saved us from this mess in the past, or is the right <coughs> answer to my question, question that rat hole belongs in the lucid boff? That question does belong in the lucid boff, and, and part of the issue is that we thought in the past that normalization forms were in fact solving this problem. The problem in this case is that the, the be with the Hamza above, like the, the combining sequence, and the, and the precomposed um, character are, from Unicode's point of view, totally different characters. And therefore, they don't normalize to one another. That's the short version. Come on Wednesday for the long version. Bingo. That's exactly what I wanted you to say. Thank you. Uh, let's alternate. Uh, no, I guess we can't alternate. Right, on, Try again. Yeah, keep, keep. Needs the, the IoT. There land. we go. Yeah. Carrie Lynn, Verizon. And uh, I, I guess my question was similar, and the answers probably show up at the BOF. Uh, you, you mentioned that there are you know, many of these cases uh, of composable characters. What's the definition of many? Do you have uh, some <laughs> rough approximation? Well, we know that we've got definitely on the order of tens that we have. have Oh, sorry. Um, the question was, I, I said that there are several of these cases, uh, or, or Kerry rather said there are several of these cases. How many is several? Um, we're pretty sure it's not hundreds, um, and we're pretty sure it's tens. Um, but the truth is we don't exactly know um, because there are like really a lot of Unicode characters, and we don't want to go through them one at a time. Mm. <laughs> right. That was the whole goal, not go through them all one at a time. I guess one question I have is whether it's possible to do something like a Martians list or something. You know, that's excellent question, and I think that Wednesday, Wednesday is your day. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Michael Richardson. I wanted to uh, ask or comment about the semi work, and um, it, it has been, you know, maybe 15 years that the IPsec working groups have received various, you know, could you please expose this because I could do th nice things for you if only you would, you know, let me mess with your packets. And um, we, it came back over and over and over again, you know, this kind of conversation. And I can remember a conversation with one very spirited, you know, telecommunication 3G guy in Vienna. And I kept saying to him, what's in it for me? <laughs> right? I'll be happy to tell you anything you like, but what's in it for me? The, the, the end point, right? And what I discovered was that either he didn't know or he wasn't willing to tell me, or his agenda was not what he was stating it was. Um, and so I guess one of my questions of going forward, and I don't know if there's some negotiation that's going to be happening with the middle box uh, community, I guess I can call it that. Um, but I guess I kind of wonder, is there gonna be some kind of standard questionnaire that they're gonna be said, like essentially, what's in it for me? Yes. Or us, IETF, yes, okay, yes. thank you. That's, that there will makes, be, yeah, that come, makes me come, come to the BOF and help us with that. I mean, we have, we have that on the, I mean, that's one of the, it's like slide number six at the BOF. Awesome, so, thank you. So come and help us make that list of questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll be one of the co-chairs uh, for that BOF, Michael, and uh, uh, one of the things that, you know, before we even start, sh you know, any sort of arrow throwing about this, by that, by, you know, having the usual naysaying of, uh, that, that, that happens. The first question that has to be asked is, what is the value of the new service that the existing services don't bring? So that has to be answered, in, I think, as we 
as this technology matures. Whether it gets answered Wednesday or not, I don't know, but hopefully it'll be a good start to it. Mike Jones, Microsoft. I'm going to follow up on the Unicode thing again. And I'll ask a naive question, which I suspect other people are wondering as well. There's a lot of characters that are indistinguishable from humans. Greek uppercase A looks a lot like Roman, or uppercase alpha looks a lot like Roman uppercase A. Uh, is it the case that this wasn't a problem before because the normalization rules spoiled them? Or why was this not already a problem? So it is already a problem, and there are other kinds of, of, of such problems. And the, 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 the really short version of this is Wednesday is your friend. But um, <laughs> the slightly longer version of that is this particular case is an example where there was no property that, by which you could derive something else. So for instance, in the example you just gave, one of them is Greek script and the other one is Latin script. So I have something by which I could make some kind of determination. And, and this is a case where we don't seem to have that yet. Thank you. And Warren, I, Mari? Oh, yes, oh, please. Go ahead. I just want to add that um, what's special about these cases is really the only thing that distinguishes them is language, which is not really a property. And so that's why the lucid boff is the language for your locale free Unicode identifiers is what happens when you don't have a locale or a language ID together with the identifier. <laughs> that's when the problem comes up. And so that's the scope of the box. Warren, Kamari, Google. So I wasn't really following the IDNA stuff that closely, but I seem to remember the Unicode consortium telling us this wasn't going to happen. <laughs> is that wrong? <laughs> well, um, I don't. Oh, so, so um, Warren Kamari said that uh, he wasn't following the IDNA stuff too closely, but he seemed to recall that the Unicode folk, by which I think he means some people who are active in Unicode, um, uh, told us that this wouldn't happen. And I, I, so there are three things that I want to say about that. Um, uh, the first thing is um, it's very, very hard um, to tell the true story of the past. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to go into my personal life. Um, <laughs> but but, but this, the second thing I would say is that Unicode is really hard. The, the, the case that we, we stumbled on is, is this Hamza above. That was the one that, that first got us into it, though it's not the only case. And I want to emphasize this is not an Arabic problem. Um, it, there are several pages of, of, of densely written text in the Unicode standard about how Hamza is hard and really complicated. And you can reproduce that problem for every single other, other script because every script has some sort of weird corner because humans were involved in it. And when, when humans do things over thousands of years, they mess stuff up. So, so that's the final thing that, that you know, there just aren't these kinds of, pro uh, of promises. And part of the problem, and this is the, the third thing that I, I really want to say, part of the problem is that this is a case where we're trying to work on a thing that is very, very clean because we have one purpose in mind. And Unicode has all the purposes there are that you could possibly write anything down for. Unicode has to do that. And so they're going to make compromises and, 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 and trade-offs that are entirely reasonable when what you're trying to do is encode everything that's ever been done. And what we have to do is this tiny thing here, and we don't want anything to screw up. And that is not maybe the, the common goal that we thought it was. So, so maybe there was some miscommunication. I don't know. But it doesn't really matter what happened. Here we are. So let's, uh, let's go forward and solve it. I don't know if anybody else has something to say. Is there a oh, Mac. Um. Related to this discussion we uh, we're having is, is, you know, the scoping of the problem. What exactly we're, you know, trying to fix, or, and that's probably the most challenging of of the buff or our work is to make sure that we understand together with the Unicode people that we're fixing the same problem. Because over the last a few couple of months, we've been discussing, you know, trying to focus on the scope. So, you know, again, come to the buff. Hi, Phil Hunt Baker. Yeah, uh, on the middle box issue, uh, I think I'd like to see a bit more uh, attention paid to why people are deploying these middle boxes beyond the standard ITF ex response, which is 
that the people deploying them are ignorant monkeys who should know better. <laughs> and, you know, th that is a very damaging response attitude that I get frequently. On, on, on the TLS side, don't think that TLS is going to end middle boxes messing with stuff. Because the problem of man in the middle TLS search is vastly worse than anybody who hasn't measured it knows. We track all certificates that pass through our browser. There's over a million man in the middle certs out there. Pretty soon, there will be more man in the middle certs than real certs. Some of them are issued by people who actually want to break TLS because they are malicious and want to tap into t conversations. But most of them are issued inside corporations for reasons that have to do with network management within the organization that they have found can only be solved with a middle box. And I think one of the big disconnects that happened was back in the past, you know, the original IATF view was the internet is a network of networks. What you do on your network is your affair. As soon as you go to the one internet that connects the network of networks together, you speak IP and you obey the internet rules. And then we had this IP to the edge thing. And what didn't get carried along was the understanding that I might be speaking IP on this device, but that device is connected to my network. It is not connected to the internet. And that's a very subtle piece of the original internet architecture that if you go back to the founding documents, which I've been doing recently for History Project, you will find is very clear. It is in the end-to-end -end argument. You will see that. And I think that we've got to recapture that and understand why people are doing these things because they need to manage their networks and give them the tools to manage their networks and not bust TLS. All right. I don't really care about breaking TCP or IP. Breaking TLS, that's a big deal. So there are a couple of things that you raised there, so let me, let me try and take them in a couple of turns. One of them is from the SPUD perspective. And my contribution to SEMI was actually around middle boxes and path characteristics. And the fact that we were actually moving out of an era when these things are boxes to being uh, virtualized network functions that can uh, pop themselves and appear in a variety of places in the path that aren't necessarily where they were. And one of the things that writing that showed me was that we have a very unique way of looking at the path inside the IETF that presumes that the path is uh, determined by the, the source and destination and the actions of the routers between it. And the reality is that in the modern internet, the full six tuple actually determines the path you take through the internet or through the network because the six tuple determines what middle boxes you need to pass through in order to pass these administrative functions that you describe. And I think that one of the things that the workshop was very clear on was we were not trying to say these things are evil. What we were trying to say is, given that we wish to have an unbroken, encrypted, and confidential channel between the two endpoints which have started TLS or similar, um, what's the minimum we need to expose in order to make middle boxes actually be able to function without losing privacy concerns, without creating privacy concerns. So if, if you come to the BOF, you'll see much more about this, but the very basic thing we're looking at here is um, session semantics um, coming from the app to the path that tells something like a NAT, this is the start and stop of the session, so that you don't have to do heartbeats through the NAT to maintain that NAT binding because it knows when the, the uh, ID is gone that, it's, that the, the session state is gone and there's an explicit session end identifier for it to see. Similarly, we're talking about from the path back to the application, what's in essence a six-tuple ICMP, the same kind of information we would have gotten from the path 
before we saw this differentiation in paths based on the six tuple, um, now actually scoped to the way the paths really work. So I don't think that semi or the work that's coming out of it is in any way, shape, or form saying middle boxes are stupid and we have to break them. We know that's a losing proposition. Um, we understand that that's just going to make TLS interception more and more prevalent. What we're trying to figure out, and this is what we encourage everybody to come to SPUD and work with us on, is what are the session semantics that meet the characteristics that Brian laid out? <laughs> They're something we can trust but verify. They're useful enough to get deployment, as Michael pointed out early, and that they're the minimal set. So we don't have to give everybody everything to get anything. So what's the six, six tuple? Sorry? Uh, we can't seem to figure out what the sixth part of the sixth tuple uh, DSCP is. DSCP marking oh. to go with the, okay. the other part of the five, five tuple, sorry. Um, and the other bit that I wanted to say in terms of uh, your concern that we are not worried enough about TLS interception, as the program lead for the PrivSec uh, program, I can, I can tell you we're terrified. Um, we're happy to be more terrified if you want to explain it to us more, but what we really need to do isn't be terrified about it, it's to work our way past what's causing it. And um, I think that one of the things we're doing is matching efforts to increase encryption with looking at the constraints of the web PKI and what second sources of truth can be introduced like DNS-based Dane sources of truth or other things that help us move past the point where we're trusting everyone to tell us anything. We really need to get past that and we all know it. So once again, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, some of it's gonna be in SPUD, some of it's gonna be in Utah, some of it's gonna be in lots of other places. Um, but uh, we just need to get cracking. Quiet bunch. And I, I have to say, I am astonished that the lights never really changed colors in the way that was unexpected. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess, I guess probably I end up paying out, right? Um, uh, so I see nothing more. I think we're about uh, at the end here because there's nobody at the microphone. So thank you very much and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.